world is facing the profound challenge that is Iran. A time when the so-called Arab Spring has perhaps resulted in more questions than answers. And at a time when Jewish communities throughout Europe are feeling less secure about the future, we are fortunate to have David Harris with us to share some of his thoughts. For those of you who have heard David Harris speak, he hardly needs an introduction. He's the executive director of the American Jewish Committee, an author, a radio and newspaper commentator. And for those of you who are not familiar with David Harris, let me say that he is, in my estimation, perhaps the most important and effective Jewish ambassador and representative to much of our world. He is impassioned by our Jewish values and ideals, and he lives and breathes a vision of Jewish well-being. I'm proud that David and his wife Juliet and their three sons are longtime members of our congregation. I'm delighted that David's mother is yet again with us this year, and it is very much an honor to call upon David Harris, who will surely enrich this Rosh Hashanah for all of us. Shana Tova. I'm going to leave my watch in front of me to give the audience false assurance. <laughs> For those of you who have heard me speak here before on the High Holy Days, you know that there is an initial problem every time a David Harris is introduced. Because inevitably, as I've indicated before, there's more than one out there. So let me catch up on the last two years since I spoke to you at Yom Kippur in 2010. The other day on the front page of the New York Times in an article about Mitt Romney's student days at Stanford, it was mentioned that David Harris was the president of the student body at Stanford when Mitt Romney was an undergraduate. That was not me. <laughs> For those of you who know who Sheldon Adelson is and have been following his support for the Republican Party in this presidential election, you may know that he sued David Harris for alleged defamation, including the assertion that Sheldon Adelson was somehow involved with prostitution in his casino business here and abroad. That David Harris is not me. <laughs> For those of you, however, who are Jets fans and who watched the game yesterday, if you would like to confuse me with David Harris, the linebacker, <laughs> my privilege. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great sight to see all of you from the Bima in a synagogue that Rabbi David Greenberg essentially built from scratch. And it reminds me, for those of you who recall the weekly magazine Look, which together with life for so many decades really defined popular culture. Call it People Magazine with a bachelor's degree. <laughs> in May of 1964, Look Magazine had a feature article which was entitled, The Vanishing American Jew. Now fast forward 48 years, and look who's vanished. The Jewish people, or Look Magazine. <laughs> it's 
quite a story. We often believe that Catholics are the original Trinitarians. But as you heard a moment ago from Rabbi Greenberg, in speaking about repentance and prayer and charity, perhaps we are the original, if not Trinitarians, and certainly Trilogists. And in that spirit, let me share with you a story. It's said that in a small New England town, there were two houses of worship. There was a synagogue, and there was a Catholic church. And over the years, the rabbi and the priest became very close friends. So much so that one day when the priest received an urgent appeal from Rome to travel there on church business, he turned to his friend the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I have an unusual request, but there's no one else who can do it for me. I need you while I'm away to take care of the confession box. <laughs> The rabbi was just a bit surprised by the request, but he couldn't say no to his dear friend, the priest. So he went over one day and sat with the priest in the confession box in order to get the ropes. They sat together, crammed into the box, and after a few minutes, a man comes and he says through the screened window, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. What was the nature of your sin, my son, said the priest. Father, I have committed adultery. How many times, my son? Three, Father. Son, say three Hail Marys, put five dollars in the poor box, and please don't do it again. The priest then turned to the rabbi and said, it's not that difficult. The rabbi said, let me watch one or two more and I think I'll get the hang of it. A few minutes later, a lady, comes and through the screen window says, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. The priest says, my daughter, what was the nature of your sin? She says to him, Father, I have committed adultery. He says, how many times? She says, three. He says, my daughter, say three Hail Marys, put five dollars in the poor box and please don't do it again. She leaves. The rabbi says to the priest, I think I've got it. Go to Rome. I'll take care of it. The priest leaves for the airport. The rabbi sits and waits. A few minutes later, a man comes, kneels before the screen window and says, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. The rabbi says, what was the nature of your sin, my son? The man says, I have committed adultery. The rabbi says, how many times? The man says, once. The rabbi says, you're in luck, my son. We have a special this week, three for five dollars. <laughs> I want to say three things. And they're not born in sin. Because I think that the High Holy Days are the perfect time when, as rabbis tend to <clears throat> point out, nice to see you again. And you're all here. I think it's a time for us to return to basics, if you will, to the three basic elements of our identity, and to explore them and to understand them and reaffirm them on this very special of occasions. I, as a Jew, sit, if you will, on a three-legged stool. One leg is my faith. A second leg is my people. And a third leg is my land. If I remove any one of those three legs from my stool, the stool will no longer remain stable and secure. But in today's world, each of those legs, if you will, within the Jewish community, I'll get to beyond in a moment, is under challenge, even assault. America among Western nations, with the exception until recently of Ireland, 
and you know what happened in Ireland, is the most religious, God-fearing country in the world, except for the Jews. We are the most God-skeptical community in this most God-fearing and religiously observant country in the democratic world. We have our questions about God. We have our questions about faith. What is the meaning of all of this written in Aramaic and Hebrew? Why should it speak to me? And yet, for me at least, and I suspect for many of you, there are very compelling messages in the faith, whether one is God skeptical or God fearing, or in the confused middle like many of us. For one thing, Judaism has contributed to the world perhaps the single most important revolutionary concept of human knowledge of any of the faiths over the thousands of years of recorded history. It's two simple words, Betzelem Elohim, in the image of God. Why is it that whether it is in this makeshift synagogue, if you will, or whether it is in Sharei Tefillah's established synagogue, that there are no images of God on the walls, no attempt to replicate in human terms who that God is. Because if each of us is created in the image of God, and that's precisely what B'Tselem Elohim means, how can one render an image of that God? Is he female or male? Is he black or white, short or tall, stout or thin, straight or gay? Who is that God? Judaism teaches us, it teaches me, that God is the goodliness within us, the divine spark inside this human body which is ours for but a precious moment in human history. It is ours either to kindle or to suppress. The gift of Judaism is godliness on earth. The gift of Judaism is in the Ten Commandments. Yes, you would say Mel Brooks said there were originally three tablets of five commandments each, <laughs> reduced to two tablets when he dropped one. But whether it's 15 or whether it's 10, the core issue of the Ten Commandments is not whether or not it belongs in a, in a Mississippi courtroom on the wall and whether or not it's a breach of church-state separation in this country. The core message of the Ten Commandments, the core message of the ethics of the fathers, the core message of the prophets, is that there needs to be a moral code. There needs to be a moral GPS system, a moral positioning system that places us in this world. What preceded the Jewish people was child sacrifice, <laughs> stone worship, idol worship. Jews created a moral code, a moral conscience, a dissatisfaction with the status quo. It's astonishing to me every day, for better, for worse, I read the New York Times. Sometimes for better, I'll come to the for worse in just a moment. And I read the obituary page as well. One of my beloved AJC colleagues once said to me, I always read the obituary page first in the New York Times because if I don't see my name there, I know I'm going to have a good day. <laughs> but just today, with the most unlikely of names, Ziva Fujis, big story, survivor of Nazi Germany, who became a fe feminist author and theoretician, who challenged established wisdom, and who made enormous progress. Wherever you look, 
It's not my accident. The human rights movement, the anti-apartheid struggle, the civil rights movement, the effort for human dignity and human freedom for universal values. It's not by accident the Jews are represented disproportionately. It comes from something. It comes from somewhere. It comes from that moral GPS system, from that moral conscience and moral code that have been intrinsic to the DNA of the Jewish people now for thousands of years. And the third thing in the spirit of trilogisms that motivates me about my faith is linked to the first two. Unlike many other religions, we are commanded to act. If you will, to be, yes, God's ambassador on earth. It's not about outsourcing the task. It's not about judgment in afterlife. It's not about submission, as another religion would have you. It's about partnership. And so when people on both sides of the Civil War pray to the same God in the 1860s, using the same texts and using the same hymnals and say, oh God, please ensure victory for me and safety for me, that's the wrong notion of God. Both sides are praying to the same God. Rather, the right notion of God, I believe, is not what God can do for us, it's what we can do for the notion of God. It's not about asking God to help us win the next football game between Byram Hills and Horace Greeley. Rather, it's about what each of us can do in our time and on our watch with this spark within us. That's the notion of Judaism. So whether we're God-fearing or God-skeptical, wherever we come out on those surveys in this country, the essential elements of this faith, it seems to me, transcend all of us along that spectrum. And so to a people. For some, there's a problem with the notion of Jewish peoplehood today. We're told by some too particularistic, too narrow. I love everyone. I love all humanity. Why should I care more about Jews than others? There's something that vaguely smacks of a kind of, ooh, xenophobia. I think one can do both. One can love the Jewish people and feel connected to the Jewish people, feel connected spiritually, metaphysically, generationally, historically to the Jewish people, and at the same time embrace universal values and universal concerns. It's a false choice to believe we have to pick one versus the other. I come to the services for many reasons. The beauty of the setting, the transcendence of the music of MJ, the soloists, and the choir, the stirring words of my friend Rabbi Greenberg. But at the end of the day, I come above all for something that happened a few moments ago, Avinu Malkeinu. I come because Avinu Malkeinu penetrates my soul, because Avinu Malkeinu connects me horizontally with every Jew everywhere in the world who today on Rosh Hashanah, whether in synagogue, be it orthodox, reform, conservative, you name it, and vertically, generationally, from Sinai forward, through the shtetlach, through the Inquisition, through the Pale of Settlement, through the ghettos, and yes, through the, the entrance, Arbeit Mach Frei at Auschwitz, Avinu Malkeinu connects me vertically, as well as horizontally, to every Jew, everywhere, every time. That's why I come to affirm my peoplehood, my link, my connection to Jews everywhere and at all time. My mother, who is here, 89 years old, didn't have 
and easy upbringing. First with her parents and her brother refugees from communism, lucky to get out of Stalin's Russia and to find a haven in France, only to encounter in 1940 the arrival of the Nazis across the not so invincible Maginot Line. And my mother told me the story of her brother's girlfriend, Natasha. My brother urged Natasha to join my mother and her family as they fled south with other Jews, trying to escape the Nazis and trying to find safe refuge in a world that largely turned their backs on the Jews when they could have been saved. But Natasha's parents told Natasha, you don't need to go with them because you see, you're a French-born Jew. They are Russian-born Jews. The Nazis will go for them. The Vichy will go for them, but not for us. Very much in the spirit, perhaps, of the German Jews who held up their iron crosses from World War I to try and persuade the Nazis that they were loyal Germans in the last great war. To what avail? We're all my mother, and we're all Natasha, and none of us should be under any illusion because Natasha was arrested and deported and never came back from the camps, though she was a French-born Jew. We are all linked by Sinai, the vision, the apex of our experience, and yes, we are all linked by Auschwitz and Belzhitz and Treblinka, the lowest point in our existence. And finally, with respect to people, we're linked by common destiny. Later this year, we will mark 25 years since the great march for Soviet Jewry in Washington. On the eve of President Gorbachev's historic visit to meet President Reagan, more than 250,000 American Jews traveled from across the United States and Canada to stand together with Natan Sharansky, who had recently been released, and Yuli Edelstein, who had recently been released, and then Vice President George H.W. Bush, to say to, to President Gorbachev, Shalach et Ami. <coughs> Apusti narod moi, let my people go. And in that great affirmation of peoplehood, of Jews from all over the world identifying with the plight of other Jews who wished to sing Avinu Malkenu but could not, who wished to celebrate Rosh Hashanah openly but could not, who wished to learn the words Shelach et Ami, Hebrew words and could not, we created a lifeline. We affirmed peoplehood, and we wrote a new chapter in Jewish history that's remarkable for its success against the most authoritarian and powerful nation in opposition to the United States, the Soviet Union. And finally, the land, the land of Israel. For some, Israel is a distant, vague notion no more than 40% of American Jews, repeated AJC surveys reveal, have ever even visited <coughs> Israel. I dare say that many more have visited Rome, Paris, London, Madrid, Cancun, Acapulco, Hawaii, you name it. And yes, for some, Israel is even an embarrassment. Wherever you see, on campuses around this country, in union movements around this country, the BDS flag, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the D flag for delegitimization, yes, you will find some Jews who not only criticize the state of Israel, but wish its dismantlement. Folks, allow me. Are we completely out of our minds? What is the identity of the Jewish people? 
without a connection to a land where this all began. What were our forefathers talking about when they wandered in the desert for 40 years? What was the covenant about, if not a connection between a land, a people, and the faith? And while we may joke that Moses wandered for 40 years because he refused to ask for directions, it's a lot more serious than that, isn't it? How can you remove Jerusalem from the identity of the Jewish people and sit here in synagogue and affirm Jewish identity? And how can we even skip Israel on our travel map as if it were irrelevant or meaningless to our curiosity, not to say our identity? And let me go a step further. For those of you who are still on board with me, Israel needs us. In the very real, practical sense, Israel needs us. And I'm not talking about money. It's another issue. Fortunately, Israel is becoming a wealthy country. And with the discovery of natural gas, it may one day be a mega wealthy country, God willing. And you'll have to eliminate the other joke about Moses wandering in the desert looking for the only country in the region that didn't have oil. <laughs> we have other jokes. The IDF faces an enormous, almost unimaginable set of strategic challenges today. And it doesn't matter who the Prime Minister of Israel is. The challenges would be the same. Iran? Well, Iran didn't begin its nuclear program on Netanyahu's watch, nor for that matter on Obama's watch. It began it on Clinton's watch. It continued during Bush's watch. How many prime ministers of Israel are included in that span? The events in Egypt? We're told the president slipped, but I don't think he slipped. I think he did one of those things which sometimes politicians of both parties desperately try to avoid doing, telling the straight, unvarnished truth about things. And look at how, in this case, this administration had to backpedal in order to try and explain that when the, what the president said was not really what he said, much less what he meant. Forgive me. Nonsense. Nonsense. The president meant it because the president was right. And if you're the Israeli prime minister, whatever your name might be, you have to be worried about what happens next. Your natural gas relationship with Egypt is over. Fifteen terror attacks in the span of one year against the pipelines, it's over. Your embassy has been attacked in Cairo already without adequate protection. You have the Muslim Brotherhood, which at times speaks with forked tongue, in English to us, the tones and sounds we wish to hear, and in Arabic to other audiences, different messages rooted in the Muslim Brotherhood's core ideology. You're the Prime Minister of Israel and you look at Syria. You look at the ongoing barbarism. And you look at a world which is completely paralyzed. 25 to 30,000 people butcher. And the United Nations cannot even agree on something to do. Kofi Annan has re resigned in frustration. And all that foreign ministries can do is issue ever more angry, verbal tirades. But nothing else changes. And by the way, I can't help but ask, as a Jew, if Bashar Assad could get his hands on Israelis rather than fellow Syrians, how would the mayhem look? And what would the world's reaction be to that? And what about his chemical weapons arsenal, among the largest in the world? Into whose hands will that fall? That too is Israel's problem. And what about Lebanon? 21 of 30 cabinet members of the Lebanese government today are connected to Hezbollah. Hezbollah, the Hezbollah that killed American Marines. 
the Hezbollah that attacked the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires in 1994, killing 85 people, the Hezbollah that killed six people in Bulgaria in July, the Hezbollah that the European Union still will not recognize as a terrorist group because they're still not convinced there's enough <coughs> evidence. You're the Prime Minister of Israel and you look at Gaza. I beg you, if you have a strong stomach, read the Hamas Charter. Don't listen to David Harris, don't listen to AJC, don't listen to Israel, read the Hamas Charter. It's available in English on the web. And then ask yourself, is this a neighbor that any country could live with? Is this a neighbor that Israel can live with easily? And yes, as we circle Israel's borders, what about the Palestinian Authority? The hope for partner in our age-old yearning for peace. Lo yisagoy el goy chedev lo yilmadu od milchama. The words of Isaiah, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. We don't need sermons from the New York Times. We don't need sermons from the Financial Times. We don't need homilies from the BBC about the importance of making peace. We need peace partners. And I would wish Mahmoud Abbas was that peace partner. I would pray that he were that peace partner. I believe in a two-state agreement. I believe in the necessity of territorial compromise if that's the price to pay for enduring peace. It's a price worth paying. But with a leader who glorifies terrorists who have killed Jews, who pays a good chunk of his international welfare that he receives for the families of those terrorists who are sitting in Israeli jails for having killed innocent Israelis, who is about to go to the United Nations later this month to demand a state and recognition by the General Assembly, who is doing everything possible to circumvent the only place he'll find peace, at the peace table with Israel, how much comfort and solace can I have? Israel is facing enormous battles, but there's a second battlefront and the second battlefront is either manned by us or it goes unmanned. It's the battlefront that's happening on more and more high schools, more and more college campuses, more and more trade unions, more and more local city councils and state legislatures, more and more pension funds, more and more stores that carry Israeli products. There's a second battlefront around the world to delegitimize the state of Israel to cripple it, to declare it a pariah state. Now, if this is a typical Jewish audience, there'll be more than one view on how Israel should extricate itself from its strategic challenges. But let's be clear and eagle-eyed. The people I'm talking about aren't interested in whether you're on the center, the left, or the right. They don't want Israel to exist. What part of that sentence do we not understand? They don't want Israel to exist. And while their confrères are plotting terrorist attacks and nuclear weapons in Iran, they're carrying the campaign on the battlefronts here, knowing particularly that if they can drive a wedge between the United States and Israel, all bets are off. For Israel has no other essential strategic friend in the United States. Dear friends, dear congregants, that's our battle. That's not their battle, that's our battle. That's the second front. That's where we come in. We come in here. We come in on every campus, in every city and state, in every election campaign, whatever your party may be. Again, the goal of the exercise has to be to keep this country aligned with the state of Israel. And I'm not talking about the daily spats, the daily crisis du jour. They will pass. They will pass. What I'm talking about is something else. It's what President Obama just discovered. 
Do we really think that all of these protests, the murder of Chris Stevens and the other three American diplomats, were all a simple, visceral, spontaneous response to a crude, amateurish, otherwise unknown film which has been on the web since July? <coughs> I don't buy it. It's something more. Just as Israel has discovered that when Shimon Peres, the Nobel laureate in peace, was prime minister, terrorist attacks against Israelis continued. So President Obama is discovering that despite our reset, there are those who hate us. It doesn't matter who sits in the Oval Office. It doesn't matter who sits in the Prime Minister's office. And we need to be able to sharpen our lens to understand that. So yes, let's continue with our debates about Republicans and Democrats and Israelis of the right, the center and the left. But let's not lose sight of the core issue of the defense of core democratic American values and the defense of Israel's right to exist. People say, fine, David, maybe you're right. But you know, what can I do? What can I do? I'm one person. I'm in school. I'm working. I'm elderly. I'm taking care of someone. My answer to us is that everyone here at Caramore, everyone can do something more than they're currently doing. Each of us, myself included, every one of us can in some way stand up and reaffirm our identity, the trilogy of faith, land, and people, the pride we feel in who we are, the determination to speak to our highest values, and yes, to stiffen our spine, to defend ourselves against those who wish us ill. Everyone can join an organization, everyone can speak to a political candidate, everyone can make a donation, everyone can sign a petition, everyone can write a letter, everyone can do something. We as a community remain obsessed 70 years after the fact. Where was American Jewelry when the St. Louis was off the coast of Florida with 936 European Jews who could have been saved? And we didn't have the clout, we didn't have the spine, we didn't have the know-how to figure out how to persuade an administration for whom we had overwhelmingly supported to let them in. They went back to a known fate. What will it be said of American Jewry in the year 2012? Things don't have to rise to the standard of the Shoah to challenge each of us as Jews with a moral conscience and a moral code and the knowledge that our godliness is in acting and not simply in believing or praying. What is it that we will do? I think the answer is obvious. I hope the answer is obvious. I thank Rabbi Greenberg for the privilege once again of speaking to you on this Rosh Hashanah, Shana Tovah.